Anyway, anyone who's known me during the, uh, my time here with Explore Mars, but especially before that, knows that I was very much invested in analog missions. Not just the uh, Mars Desert Research Station or the Flashline Mars Arctic Station, uh, research station, which both have been involved with, either uh, mission director, I was the mission director of these stations, why was I the mission director? Well, someone needed to lead it, and it sounded like a nice title to pick. Because truth be told, I invented that title. Truth also be told, it gave me some clout with NASA, which is kind of amazing. And I could tell them, you know, I haven't lost a crew yet. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, that's easy. No, it's still dangerous analog missions, and now I'm serious. It still means that, you know, people need to be careful. Anyway, so we, I've done this for years. I love working with crews. I love, you know, the science they bring. I love the enthusiasm they bring. I love the fact that they go home and while they're there and before and after, there's media, they go into schools. So they spread the disease that's called Mars advocacy. And that's a pandemic I want to cause. One, there's no deaths involved there, I think. And, you know, that's not really detrimental to your health. Now, recently, and I, I joined the Stardust Research Station and Space Center as mission director, because he likes that title. I invented it, he likes it. So, okay. So, I, I, like I said, I, I think the analogs are very important work. You know, you have to test and train. If you don't, then people will think that, you know, being a geologist on Mars is just, you know, different environment, I'm fine. No. A geologist cannot pick up a rock on Mars and blow on, up on it to get rid of the you know, dust to see the actual stone. And if you go on an analog mission and you're you know, using these analog suits, then you have a helmet and you can wait for it. The geologist gets outside the first time. He or she picks up the rock and yay! You can't blow on it, yes. So, you know, you're having fun. Not nice, perhaps, but, you know, that's, that's Martian humor for you. Now, the panel today consists of Dr. Shona Pandya, the Director of Medical Research with Orbital Assembly Corporation. Now, that's a person who has done, you know, analogs a bit different than just, you know, Dusty, because she's been an aquanaut uh, with the Neptune mission. She tested, uh, um, you know, commercial spacesuits in microgravity for Project Possum. And as is normal with women, I find, and you know, men have that too, but women especially, I feel, you know, she does so many things that I could go on and on and on and on, which I won't. But what I liked very much, as I am now somewhat a Canadian, you know, um, is she is also the uh, life science chair for the Canadian Space Society. So, you know, great. Thank you. Now, speaking of Canada, then again, it brings me indeed to Jason Michaud. He's the CEO of Stardust Technologies, but for the purpose of this panel, it's much more important that he is the driving force and the founder of the Stardust Alliance. And he will have his uh, research station. We all get why it's not called the Stardust Analog Research Station. Do an acronym. In your hand, don't say it. <laughs> so it's the Stardust Research Station and Space Center. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be there, north, eight hours drive, he says to me from uh, uh, Toronto. I've never been further than three hours drive up north, so this will be an adventure for me. Well, the thing is, though, that if we say Canada or the USA, where we're here right now, then most people think of settlers from Europe. Right, that's the USA, that's Canada, that's what we are. That's not true, of course. There were people here, and the First Nations, and in many ways our society hasn't been taking them along with everything we're doing. And education, space, that's one of the things that very often they, they are not taken along enough. Jason very strongly feels, and I am right there with him, that we need to do something about that that it needs to be inclusive, and inclusive is really inclusive. It's not just, you know, skin color, and it's not just gender, or even sexual, you know, orientation. It is all the peoples of this planet. Because if there's one thing I don't want to happen, if we go to Mars, and that first person, that's going to be a woman, by the way, 
not because I say so, but because astronauts among themselves years ago already decided that. And so whatever mission control here on Earth will say, a woman will do it because the male astronauts feel we have the moon, so they will have Mars. Fair enough, you know? And the first time they said it to me, I thought they were trying to appease me as a woman. <laughs> and apparently I had nothing to do with that. My, my mistake. Like I said, so we need to take everyone with us. Because if we go there, it's for all humankind, but it should also really include all humankind going there. I mean, personally, I always call the moon missions an all-American party. And the next one is not going to be just one nation, whatever nation that is. Not even, you know, not the Chinese, not the whatever, the United Arab Emirates, all of us. So P.G. Marcelino, also now a colleague of me, is like me a veteran of the Mars Desert Research Station. He um, uses film as a means to storytelling to engage the public in our next step in human evolution, exploring our solar system, beginning with living on Mars. His passion for telling the stories made him an award-winning documentarian. Nice word. Um, in 2020, uh, Marcelino joined the International Community of Analog Astronauts, 2020, right? So that was postponed for two whole years. Well, there's a silver lining to that story. Because if you already know you're on a crew and you know your crewmates and you have to wait and, you know, of course, two years ago they didn't know it was going to be postponed. So you keep, you know, interacting. Then the great thing is you really build up your crew and you build up and you think of everything and you really, really prepared. Um, all very wonderful, and so he was there, he tested, he was also the XO, I know, he was crew 238, and, um, you know, it's, it's one of the things that brings all of us together, because, you know, he's Scottish and Canadian away, and a lot of other things. I'm not Scottish. <laughs> you are, because you're, you're claiming a lot of stuff like Scottish, you know, that's the way it goes, right? <laughs> We're all Martians, and I've never been in Mar on Mars. Then we have Mac Mokawi, and you know, everyone who's been in the uh, main room already knows his enormous passion to get education about STEAM everywhere, not in the easy classrooms, and not even in a remote village, but you know, in, in a refugee camp, because Malik is right, it's what we've known for years, if you go to a very poor neighborhood somewhere on this planet, where people are really poor and you know, disenfranchised and, and underserved, they are passionate about space. And you go like, why? I mean, your life is a struggle. No, it gives hope. If your life is a struggle from hour to hour, then the idea that we can do space and perhaps my nation or perhaps even I or my kids might be part of that space race, that's not race, the space exploration, that gives hope. And we need food, we need shelter, we need medication, we need education, but what we most need, we humans, is emotional hope. And so space gives hope, and Malik was so right to bring that, because it definitely needed hope where he was. So, you are going to reach every child. The analogs are going to reach every child, and man and woman, if we do it right. And Beth, herself, an analog astronaut, and not just one. Lots of experience, also a great communicator, a great storyteller, and the stories that you make on your podcast, that, you know, pe people love stories. You know, we might not be sitting around a campfire looking at the sky because there's no light yet because we're in Babylon, but we still like the stories because that's what inspires us, and Beth is great at that. So Beth is our leader here in this discussion, and she'll decide who was talking where, and how we're doing it, and I think we're in good hands. Would you like to stay here no. and join us? Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Wow, what what a wonderful, wonderful introduction. There's so many. This is so wonderful that it's recorded because so many people are going to be able to watch this. And I want to come and invite, as Artemis did so well and so lovely, students and for us to connect with students and students to watch this. If you're a teacher, if you're someone in any kind of field that touches the lives of students, 
please invite them to watch this as we'll be sharing it. It'll be on the website, hopefully indefinitely. And we'll look back and say, remember when we just had a few analogs and now there's many all over the world. There are many all over the world and we'll get into that right now. But again, this is something that is going to be, I know students ask us constantly. We are ambassadors in so many ways. So let's get into that. I'd love to go ladies first, if you gentlemen don't mind. And Katie is here to help us. So if you'd like to walk through your presentation, we'll start with that. We obviously will have questions. We do not have to stay for the whole two hours, but folks, this is a conversation, I think, from this wonderful panel of talented analogs and astronauts and talents that we might enjoy that the entire time, and that's fine. So um, Shauna, please start us and in, walk us through your program. Sure. All right, so we have five minutes, 25 slides. We're gonna blitz through this, okay? So to summarize the conference to date, um, if I had to summarize, what we've learned about Mars so far. Next slide. It's simply that Mars is trying to kill us. Um, <laughs> so let's dig that a bit deeper and unpack that a little bit. So to add a little bit more dimension <laughs> to that, space is hard, space is expensive, and we need to retire risk. So what I would like to hope to achieve over the next five minutes is reframing what we think of as an analog and an analog environment and what benefits we can derive from it. Um, so. When we think of analog environments, it's very easy to, you know, um, be very reductive and think about a Mars simulation, a lunar simulation, and work on crew dynamics. But I would like to offer you a different definition. Let's think about analogs as an environment that in some way replicates an aspect of the spaceflight environment, whether we're talking about altered gravity, isolated and confined, remote and resource limited. Um, and let's talk about what we can extract from each of these environments, because we don't have to be gone for two weeks or eight months, and we can learn a lot over 20 seconds of microgravity. So next slide, what do we learn from extreme and anal analogous environments on Earth? Next slide, let's start off with altered gravity environments. Artemis was great in her introduction to me. She pretty much told you all of the analogs that I've done, um, but they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So first one would be microgravity. Next slide. So this is where we've tested um, intravehicular activity suits with the National Research Council of Ottawa. Uh, we've partnered with the Canadian Space Agency to make sure that biomonitoring devices that David Saint-Jacques used up on station in 2018 was space ready. So even if we're not in you know, a Mars simulation for two weeks, we can use that 20 second period of microgravity to increase the TRL or technology readiness level of a technology and make it space worthy. Um, I apologize if you hear lots of TLAs during this talk, three letter acronyms, that's what space is about. So what else can we learn from altered gravity environments? What about gravity offset? You know, 20 seconds, next slide, isn't a lot of time. Um, so what if you just wanna practice the maneuvers, what it's like when your weight is offloaded? So this is us testing an EVA or extravehicular activity suit on a microgravity simulation. So we have this harness that offloads 99% um, of our weight and we're able to replicate fixing a panel outside the ISS, again, in partnership with the Canadian Space Agency. Finally, Space isn't all zero G microgravity and it's not all partial or limited microgravity. We also have to worry about the increased G loads of launch. So next slide. And that's where centrifuge studies come into play. Um, next slide. Oh, that uh, one didn't come up. Okay, so in centrifuge studies, we talk about how ex understanding how the um, test subject experiences increased g loads and this is really important as we move into the commercial age and you know we have companies like blue origin and virgin galactic saying so safe your grandmother could fly um so if that's really the case we need to prove it and that's what we did what well, that's what the university of texas medical branch did by flying anyone from 18 to 89 with all manner of comorbidity everyone did really well on those centrifuge studies and increased g loads so what other kind of analogs are we exposed to let's switch over to water analogs next slide um, so we learn a lot at every level of water. So let's talk about the first, the surface. Next slide, please. Um, so this is one of our courses with the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences. We have simulated a Orion capsule and what happens during emergency egress and off-nominal landings. That's a fancy way of saying a crash test. Um, go to the next slide, please. So in this scenario, you know, sometimes those running the scenario really have fun with us, uh, add lightning, add thunder, machine guns, because, you know, they really want to test our metal and really on an aborted launch and, you know, with a reason to escape the capsule, whether it's um, a fuel lake or a fire or just 
um, unsafe uh, conditions within the capsule, we have to egress um, and climb into our emergency raft. And I found out really the hard way that it's super important to get your seals nice and snug because it's very, very hard to climb up into the emergency raft with a lot of water in your IVA suit. We learn a lot um, from using water as a neutral buoyancy facility. Next slide. Um, so this was our first run of uh, our simulated neutral buoyancy laboratory. This was in Connecticut at Survival Systems um, USA. Think of this as uh, JSC Mini, a uh, much smaller version of their 6 million gallon pool. Um, we had an airlock simulation and then we had to egress through the airlock and fix a panel with a drill and a screwdriver underwater. And it is so realistic. I still have dreams of being back there. Next slide, please. And finally, the crew dynamics, which we hear about a lot during high seas, during MDRS, during Lunaris and more. So this was the Neptune mission, nautical experiments in physiology, technology and underwater exploration. Next slide. Um, we were a crew of five, five days underwater. Our mandate was um, technological demonstrations, bio, um, physiological monitoring, as well as psychological studies. And we're still publishing data from that. This was in 2019. And those of you who follow NASA NEMO, next slide, know that just down the road from the Jules Undersea Lodge where that took place is where NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations take place. So the difference, the big difference is you're at 60 feet of depth here at um, Aquarius. So once you're in saturation, you can't just go up if there's an emergency. You have to decompress for 15, 16 hours and 47 minutes. By comparison, you could ostensibly get back to Earth and definitive medical care from ISS faster than that. So that's the value of replicating these remoteness, this isolation and resource limitedness. Next slide. Okay, as we come down to the last minute here or so, we learn lots from isolated and confined environments. Next slide, this will be a very familiar site to many of you. It looks like Tatooine, but it's a Mars <laughs> Desert Research Station, real life on fake Mars. Next slide. Um, if you go outside of your hab and you don't suit up, you're dead. It was a nice sim while it lasted. Next slide. <laughs> We've also, I've cut it out for time, but we've also done lunar um, planetary geology in Cinder Lake outside of Flagstaff, Arizona, where we trained at the same craters that the Apollo astronauts practiced their geologic tools. And what we did is we took those lessons learned and then we extrapolated on how to make the planetary tools they used better. And then we tested them in that environment and again at the CSA in the gravity offset. Next slide, please. Okay, operational environments. We're coming back to the crew di environments here, uh, crew dynamics here. So this is an example of crew resource management. This is a single research flight, unpressurized, 19,000 feet in northern Canada. And it's really all about making sure you're prepared and communicating adequately with your research pilot and your um, payload, your mission specialist. I was the payload specialist on this. Next slide. Um, and finally, near and dear to my heart, is resource-limited environments. You don't have to be in the middle of the Colorado wilderness. You don't have to be in Antarctica. If you can create that scarcity, next slide, by simply just t telling your students they don't have the resources they normally would. So this is from my operational space medicine course, again, with IIAS. All of my students, except one, were non-medical coming into this. By the end of this course, they were able to go through simple trauma, polytrauma, mass casualty and night scenarios, and they did beautifully. And I'm so proud of them. And so every year we keep upping the ante to make it more hard for them. Next slide, please. Okay, so bringing it back home in the last minute here. Why do we care about analogs? Next slide. There are, we, as we said, space is hard, space is risky, space is trying to kill us. We do it to mitigate risk. We do it to build those team dynamics. NASA famously uses the term expeditionary behavior. They go on NOLS, National Outdoor Leadership School survival missions. Um, we do it to um, practice, practice for best case scenarios and worst case scenarios, practice contingen contingencies. Anyone who's been on an analog, they're super fun. And then I cut the slide out for time, but I'm a, phys I'm a physician. I practice rurally. 95% um, of my practice is in rural ER. We're very resource limited. So we've tested biometric patches in zero G and underwater, but they've also been used in Cleveland Clinic. They've been used in para-jumper rescue exercises. Um, I've tested virtual reality underwater and in um, microgravity. Uh, we've built virtual reality medical educational modules for the Canadian Space Agency to help astronauts maintain their skills on long duration missions. And I'm sure you're thinking as we wind down, well, hey, what about, what about places on Earth? Like there's, um, you know, 2020 forward was an austere environment. We were all put into isolation. We all lost access to our traditional learning spaces. There were no sim labs. There were no physical labs. So what we've done is we've also have a very significant healthcare educational base for immersive and virtual reality technologies. We create educational modules for um, 
paramedics, medical lab techs, nurses, physicians, and more. So at the end of the day, we do this both to bring prepare ourselves for Mars, to retire risk, and to bring a little bit of that benefit home to Earth. Thank you very much. Look forward to your questions. so much incredible Jason I'd like to invite you to come up next and let's um, as you're thinking of your questions let's share them after we all do our presentations we will kind of get right going into questions because this is so interactive and we're all here as your experts and I feel like that's the best use of our time and maybe some of the questions that you have on your mind are some of the questions folks have like I said the students the teachers and the other interested analogs uh, soon to be analog members. So come on up, Jason. And uh, hello, I'm Jason uh, Michaud. Uh, for those that don't know me, I have a, I guess uh, in English, a harder name to spell. Um, so um, I come from Northern Ontario uh, from a very small village called Zbreville with less than 900 people. Uh, it, it, it gets very cold out there and I'm used to the uh, type of life in the north so I, I can kind of relate a little bit how isolations are in analogs are extremely important if you're going to be going to, to space. So today what I'm here to talk to you about is not the fact that I'm from a small community uh, that reflects more on the STEM but uh, I'm here to talk to you about the Stardust Research Station. Next slide please. So. We are, uh, I've been working uh, on microgravity flights with the Canadian Space Agency and the NRC to conduct uh, experiments so that we can utilize virtual reality and haptic feedback in space to help astronauts cope with mental health uh, through the use of haptics so that we can essentially uh, do a simulated hug from space to Earth so that you can hug your loved one and create a framework. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, microgravity only gives you that 20 seconds intervals, uh, as uh, Dr. Shoshana uh, mentioned, uh, to test the technology. So analogs are extremely important to be able to uh, do more research on Earth. And there's a lot of analogs that are focused um, on field studies. And we wanted to do something that was more focused on mental health and isolation in rural communities. Um, um, as well as uh, more um, danger, well, not dangerous environment to me, but to, uh, a bit more extreme environments and also focus on agriculture um, uh, requirements. So as you can see, year like not year long, but about almost six months out of the year, there is quite a bit of snow in uh, Northern Ontario and um, it, it is not as extreme as the I Arctic because we're more in the subarctic. Uh, but we do experience weather from minus 45 to sometimes minus 50 degrees Celsius, depending on the years with climate change, of course. Um, and what we wanted to accomplish is an analog that is accessible for students around the world and in Canada to be able to perform these uh, studies uh, without needing to fork out hundreds of thousands to go to very remote locations. So um, one of the pillars of our um, our analog is basically uh, equity, uh, diversity, and inclusivity, uh, because this is very important. If we're going to be building a society on Mars, we're going to need um, everyone from different backgrounds, and we're going to do it as humanity, not only as uh, um, just specific people. Uh, we're going to have people from different uh, backgrounds. And as Artemis echoed ear uh, said earlier, is if you're going to be going out there and it doesn't matter which race you're from or from anywhere you are, if you're in a dangerous situation, we're all humanity at the end of the day. We're all trying to survive together and it's all about being there for one another. And this is why we need to be inclusive of everyone. Uh, so one of the things that uh, when we launch our analog later this year, we've been discussing uh, with our partners at Astro Access to make it available to people with uh, uh, physical and non-physical disabilities because we realize that when you're going to be building um, uh, a society on Mars, eventually you're going to have uh, potential disabilities or people that are going to be going there that doesn't mean that they can't be part of the, the missions. We really want to make it so that everyone can uh, be part of this and, and learn. And one of the big things, and this relates more to STEM, 
uh, and also including everyone, invisible minorities, coming back to my background of very small communities, a lot of people told me, you're never going to be able to go in business, you're never going to be able to do this, and I never thought I'd be a involved with the space industry today. I never thought I'd be in DC talking to you today because again, you're a small village. People tell you you're going to be a lumberjack or a miner and uh, don't go to high school, don't go to college. And that is the mindset we need to eliminate. We need to make it accessible for everyone. And space is so big. It has so, so much importance for everyone. And whether it's uh, utilizing STEM just for space, uh, it, it's not just about space. It's also utilizing STEM to make it accessible for different careers because there's you're, you might not become an astronaut, but there's other roles in analog such as Capcom and people uh, helping with uh, the management from Earth. So we need everyone to be able to communicate together. Um, so this is not because I didn't want to look crazy when I was in the North, but I had wonderful friends and we founded this wonderful alliance to do so many beneficial uh, achievements across the world. And a lot of them came to see me in the north on our 115 acre property uh, to uh, announce the uh, development of the Stardust Space Center, where the Stardust Research Station is happening. And there's several of you in the room, and I thank you so much from the bottom of my heart from being here, uh, that, that came to uh, the announcement, otherwise I would have just looked like a guy with a shovel and a bunch of snow. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and that mentality sometimes in the north, it's, uh, oh, well, this is kind of crazy. Why do you want to do that here and whatnot? Why not? It doesn't, we, we need to make it accessible everywhere. So there's a lot of, uh, um, a lot of outreach that will be done, but not only that, the analog is very important to make it accessible to everyone. Next slide, please. So this area right here. Uh, which is about 10 kilometers out of Cochrane. You have a whole, about 115 acres. You can't really see here, but there's a big chunk of Canadian shield rocks around this area as well. And this is large, non-populated uh, land, not too far from the river, but we're focused on uh, these kind of domes that are going to be utilized here. Uh, so and Cochrane is about uh, seven to eight hours, depending if you stop or you're crazy like me, you just drive through Toronto to Cochrane. <laughs> Uh, like I did to DC, 16-hour drive. <laughs> uh, so, so basically, um, we're 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 not in the full Arctic, but we're pretty much as far as you can go before going to Moosini in the James Bay. Um, and we can replicate certain of the scenarios, such as growing food uh, in a cold environment, because we have, like I said, long winters, uh, and it is very scarce in uh, different communities. Um, and we can also replicate utilization of technology that would be used on Mars, because there is uh, on Mars, some day, there was some days that it was colder in Cochrane than it was actually on Mars. So next slide, please. <laughs> So this was during our recent event. Uh, it, it is, I, I just, I'm not the type of person that loves to read off a PowerPoint. Uh, I'd rather tell a story. Uh, so, so these was when we were unveiling the, um, the, the blueprints to the mayor of Cochrane and one of our prominent economic development uh, people. Uh, it is very hard in the North to explain what we're trying to do. So it takes a big community. That's why we announced the Stardust Alliance with over 21 partners across the world. Uh, lots of partners in the US, lots of partners in Canada, um, and nine more to come. I, and basically, like I said, a big core focal uh, is to bring researchers from different backgrounds. We have partnered with Western University, York University, um, uh, well, <laughs> Waterloo University, all the way to U of Vic and people from the Embry-Riddle University uh, to, to make this vision come to life. Um, and we're we're focused on certain topics such as isolation through utilizing virtual reality and agriculture and stuff, but we're still open-ended to be able to expand and provide other types of research, uh, such as uh, we uh, have a, uh, a dome that is focused on uh, like uh, astronaut walks, but next slide, please. So this, again, this is not to look necessarily like Mars, 
but in uh, 2018, I believe it was 2018, I'm getting the dates confused. I can't go uh, any past COVID now <laughs> because I got the COVID fog. Uh, but, but, but basically, uh, NASA went to Timmins about an hour away from Cochrane, um, and uh, they had identified the oldest water that was untapped by men or by, by um, the atmosphere in the Canadian Shield. And, the North, the Canadian Shield, was identified as one of the best analogs for Mars for finding life, like microbacterial life, uh, because we're on a, uh, essentially a, um, uh, a tectonic plate that hasn't moved in millions of years, kind of like on Mars. So I was very happy to know that <laughs> on our property, we still have uh, quite a bit of rock formation, despite all the trees. But again, our pillars are focused more on the agriculture in uh, the, um, um, the agriculture and the mental isolation and the survival condition. So for instance, I really love what uh, Dr. Sean has mentioned about analogs not just being a dome and that, because one of the main things is the North is not only Francophone and English communities. We had indigenous presence for thousands and thousands of years, and we got to recognize that they were there before us, and they are the shepherds of the land. They are the stewards of the land, and they know how to survive in these types of conditions. So we work uh, with our elders and our communities to make uh, to include them in space, not just make them a topic of it, but to include them in the uh, design of a uh, of the Mars habitat, but also in the missions because they know abilities to survive that we might not think of or that others might not think of as such. So part of the analog, there's also going to be missions focalizing on um, survival in winter conditions. Uh, I do camping at minus 25 degrees Celsius. I'm sure Dr. Sean has done that. Uh, so essentially to teach critical thinking because critical thinking is something that's going to be very useful in space and you might not get it from being just in analog scenario. But if I throw you in the, in the forest thinking that you only have three items to survive at minus 30 for, for a week, you might be getting very scared and you might decide to uh, steal your colleague's blanket or whatnot. Uh, but it, these are important, but we also include elder-based learning in uh, indigenous medicine so that you can get creative with what limited resources that you have in space. Um, so next slide, please. So I don't know if any of you are geeks by any means, uh, but I watch a lot of animes. <laughs> uh, I am. Again, small communities, and if you didn't just go fishing and hunting, uh, you were kind of an outcast. And I was talking to people when I was 14 years old uh, when they told you, and don't talk to people on the internet uh, on my dial-up connection. <laughs> I spent most of my time uh, on forums and be geeking out and uh, watching animes. Um, and uh, Dragon Ball Z uh, is what that resonated to me, uh, these domes, kind of like these space cities. And essentially, these domes, are inflatable habs that are are made to withstand the cold in many different types of environment, such as uh, up to minus uh, 40 and minus 50, up to uh, plus uh, 55 degrees Celsius. Uh, they're separated by airlocks in different locations. So next slide, please. So just to give you an idea how we're uh, making what is a, um, a little bigger analog than because again, we believe that you need some space and I can already use that a bit this week because uh, I have great columns, but uh, we're in a tiny Airbnb with five people with just three beds and I, um, it can kind of feel like claustrophobic, I haven't slept very much. You're an um, analog so astronaut, can, you can do it. Yeah, you know, <laughs> space. Uh, so essentially, um, and Artemis echoed that as well, and DJ as well, previously in conversation, we need reading room. We need a place to go. We need sometimes to it's not that we don't like people. Uh, it's we're all different, and sometimes we need to <laughs> not stay. Um, <laughs> so, so essentially, this is our main area where the uh, analog astronauts will be doing their planning and uh, getting uh, able to uh, uh, relax and eat. Um, so, our analog will not have a stove or. Uh, it, like a like a typical stove, we're focused on uh, producing our own food and also having mylar bags. And with the uh, giving you friendship center in Cochrane, 
So we're working with uh, our indigenous uh, community and elders to uh, create the food that would be typically used in space scenarios. So we don't want to uh, make it so that it feels like uh, it's easy because space is not going to be easy. Let's face it; it's, it's going to be something that's uh, going to be hard, and it might not. We want to make it for everyone, but we want to be able to study from. So. These have been replaced recently with actual airlocks like here. So no more swivel doors because they weren't uh, very accessible for uh, people in wheelchairs. We wanted to make this fully accessible for everyone. Uh, and it was something that we overlooked, but we uh, spoke to our partner that asked to access. Um, and we want, again, to make this accessible. So this is a lab, a workshop where you can go tinker and have a little break from others if you don't want to see them. Uh, and they all open through the, the airlocks. This is biomedical and uh, medical. And this is sort of divided into a pie shape with your own rooms with uh, a little bit more space. I should have included the photo. Uh, unfortunately, I did not, but we want to give you a, a room where you can go and so relax because theoretically on Mars, when you're going to be full of time, people need their own room. Otherwise, they're going to go bananas. Uh, <laughs> And this area right here is the washroom. Uh, we are going to have some type of shower in space. We're not just going to be sponge bath. As much as at first I was like, oh, we're going to just do sponge baths and stuff like that. People would have probably killed me. Uh, I, I, I can go camping for a few days without needing uh, to do that because I'm fading in nature pretty much. <laughs> uh, but my wife doesn't like it when I come back home after. <laughs> we'll straight to the shower. Uh, <laughs> But, but essentially, uh, there is a company called um, Arbicule Showers, I believe, uh, and they have this wonderful idea uh, to have water recycling, recycling as you use it. You have a limited amount of water, and it basically gets uh, recycled and filtered instantly by UVs and reverse osmosis. Just don't pee in the shower, uh, <laughs> if anyone asks. Uh, and, and basically, you're, you're using a limited amount of water, and then... Fortunately, we don't have the technology yet to have a vacuum like in space. I don't know what the toilet in Mars is going to look like. That's why we need brilliant science from different universities to help us do these studies so that we can improve. So currently, uh, the easiest solution for our area was incineration toilets uh, that you can use the matter. They, they're actually not very smelly, these ones. Uh, a lot of people, uh, so my dad works in the mining industry and they said they're the worst. Uh, because you're underground in a mine and you smell uh, yes. <laughs> that you don't want to go near. So those are a company called Cinderella, if you want to look it up. Uh, <laughs> and they're so like one of the less easiest <laughs> ones. Uh, so, and you can ask to use a waste as a fertilizer. Um, so, and then this big area right here, and just to put it in perspective, this is a 40 foot diameter. Originally it was going to be a circular shape, but Cement wise in the north, it's a lot harder to get, uh, like it will be on space. And uh, by net for financial reasons, uh, almost save a hundred thousand dollars just by making them squares instead of circles. Um, but because cement in a circle is a lot harder, but I mean, directly, but they are domes like this, hey, they're domes, yes, yes, okay, like this, yes. <laughs> uh, so, so this is a 40 foot diameter, um. I'm bad at converting on the spot to meters. Uh, I believe it is 12 meter diameter uh, because in Canada we have this problem where we're too close to the US. <laughs> Not in a bad way, uh, but, but because we use a metric and imperial system. Uh, and it's kind of confusing when you're growing up and your parents are telling you to use one system and school's telling you one system. Uh, so this is a 22 foot ceiling. So the ceiling is very high. Uh, so you kind of feel like you're not as claustrophobic in that regards. Um, so I kept this area as big area as I could as like this. This is entirely a greenhouse that is 40 foot uh, diameter with 22 feet. All greenhouse aquaponics and vertical farming research because there's a big correlation with mental health and food. And we want to be able to... To study these in any research that we do, as we discussed with the Canadian Space Agency and other partners, need to reflect in help rural Canada and indigenous populations. Because if I tell you that you go to Musini and other 
communities, you're going to see that they don't have food sovereignty in many of these communities. And we want to create food sovereignty for these communities so that they can have and be able to provide for their nation the food as well as Mars, because you're not going to want to rely just on shipments coming from space. For example, uh, not too long ago, Mussolini ran out of bread. They had to ship uh, train loads of bread up to the north because they don't grow bread there and they can't. Uh, they, they could uh, if uh, we, we provide new tech and utilize the technology <coughs> we're building for space and relate to these communities. So for that reason, this is very important uh, science that will be conducted there. Um, and uh, we really want to provide uh, for the communities through these ways and build more of these. Next slide, please. Again, as I talked about the STEM initiatives, these are, uh, I should have used better image we had, <laughs> but, but we, we do lots of outreach in the communities, uh, whether it's through rocketry, uh, whether it's through robotics, um, and uh, interacting and getting astronauts, and even, uh, that's how I met Janet Ivey. Uh, she, she talked to some of the, our communities in the north, and that was, it's all about also inspiring the youth and, and getting them into that pathway and getting uh, the youth that think they don't have an opportunity to be involved with, uh, with space because we've, uh, we had many members of the Alliance come up north recently and it was youth telling us, oh, we can't be astronauts, we can't, be, we can't go to university. Uh, we have that small mindset that we can't leave the community and we want to facilitate that. That's why it's very important in our pillars to be uh, with, uh, good. Um, so, um, for, for uh, uh, we're very happy that actually uh, Paul Porter <laughs> from Six Nation and the Youth uh, Council is actually right here today, uh, and um, he's going to be a hero to the, the, the uh, First Nations youth in the communities as being part of many of the analog missions that we're going to be doing and also outreaching. And I don't want to brag, <laughs> but, but we had a wonderful meeting with the uh, White House the other day uh, uh, with their uh, national space uh, uh, policy group uh, in talking about making space more accessible all over North America and uh, later on further out. But right now uh, the goal is to um, make a, uh, a space accessible to all the indigenous communities across North America by involving NASA and the CSA and going to the communities because sometimes people are afraid to just ask and uh, we want to be able to, with, with our wonderful uh, friends and partners, uh, to make it accessible uh, and tell these kids that they can become astronauts and uh, give them uh, the hope and maybe they might not become astronauts, but we <laughs> still inspire them. Um, so, next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Big Witch, Nessa the Pooh, uh, for, for listening to me. Um, and if you have any questions after, please feel free. But first of all, thank you, Artemis, that wonderful presentation for all of us. If this whole space thing doesn't work out for you and you need a job in sales and marketing, <laughs> call me. Wow. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I see that with that presentation. I don't know how to, how to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> Sent to, exactly to the Saudis like, like I've been doing and, and you're going to actually see uh, to avoid redundancy of what you've seen this morning I'm just going to let the video play through and probably talk over it a little bit because it's just a three minute video introduction to myself in a different manner than I've done this morning this morning I just wanted to empower all the students who should have been there on that stage and today I want to talk, or this panel, I want to talk about analogs and the reason why we're here and the reason why we do analogs. And, uh, uh, and uh, before I do that, how many people have heard uh, someone accuse NASA of faking the moon landing? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Want to hear a secret? <laughs> it's all fake. <laughs> NASA faked the t TV. Yeah, this is going to be all over YouTube. NASA faked the moon landing over and over and over in craters in Mexico until they got it right and we finally went. Those are called simulations. Those are called analog missions. It's called 
practice. It's that's what we do, and that's what every industry does. Whether you're a doctor doing it on uh, uh, on a cadaver, or you're an astronaut uh, uh, trying to do it in uh, trying to do an EVA on the International Space Station, there is an entire space station underwater in uh, uh, in. Uh, Houston called the Buoyancy Lab, where we do these simulations, where we fake EVAs underwater. So that is what we do. That is kind of the uh, 101 of how I like to explain what analogs are. We practice, and not only do we do the uh, the the Halloween costume. So from a TLR level of what I do, I'm more on the Halloween costume side, and you're more on the life support side. But uh, I do. Uh, uh, analog themed space camps. My objective is to inspire someone to say, this is cool, this is fun, this is awesome. I wanna be a scientist one day. I wanna be an engineer one day. I wanna be an astronaut someday and I don't care where you come from. So that introduction will probably be self-explanatory as you see the video and Katie, you can just let it roll through. So we start off in the country of Jordan where we went on a very long road trip and we actually got on a helicopter and I took two aviation engineering students for the very first time in the sky and they got so inspired. We did a four wheel driving over here where it might not seem like a big deal in North America, but for underserved communities to feel like they're on Mars was amazing. Look at those biodomes. Uh, it, it is Jordan, so we saw Petra, the ancient city of Petra, and it is a space camp, so look at all the astronomy that we saw, and just look at their faces as they see just the rings of Saturn. It was amazing. Uh, a lot of team building was done here, and camaraderie exercises, and here I am actually doing one of these exercises, and I actually fell, and they had to rescue me and hold me, and we sat around a campfire and really built a lot of bonding there. We did rover uh, building challenges and look at these rovers that are built by these underserved communities that are fully autonomous in GPS and navigation and cameras everywhere that are fully, you know, I would never imagine that kids that have nothing, when you believe in them and just give them a little bit of uh, uh, resources, look at the magic they can make. Look at these spacesuits that these young ladies made that are seven layers of actual science, not just Halloween costumes. We're talking everything from mobility exercises like this to full life support in a background that looks like Mars. We actually did a lot of biometrics training and learning that happened over here and a lot of music and talent shows because it is a space camp and you got to have fun. Look at those habitats. Oh my goodness, want to go back right now. <laughs> and nothing says just equitable, diverse, and inclusive, like not only just learning about plants and hydroponics here, but an astronaut that looks like that. To me, that's amazing. And we all got scuba certified because it's not just fun, it's learning life support, it's learning the checklists of of uh, being able to learn underwater. This is Monty who flies all those satellites and this is who actually lives in the camp. We don't have an ISS underwater like they do in uh, in Houston. So we train in an underwater sunken plane, but it's like the ISS and we do it in a small country and so proud of that. We were inspired by the uh, Inspiration4 mission that climbed Mount Rainier for their team building camaraderie. And look what we went up Mount Rum, highest point in Jordan, went down repelling with a habitat in the background. That was amazing. Uh, we actually did Venus analogs. We went up hot air balloons uh, up into the skies. We learned about Venus and the different clouds and sulfuric acid and the atmosphere and the difference. And that was so inspiring to all of us. And so we did what I call sandboarding, but it's actually regular boarding because you're on Mars. And the very last scene of the movie Dune was shot in this backdrop. Um, and so I wanted to replicate that because that uh, backdrop is where they filmed the Marsh, uh, what I like to ask, what are the movies, The Martian and Star Wars uh, Rise of uh, Skywalker and, and uh, uh, Last Jedi. Oh, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, Indiana Jones, Last Crusade. What do they all, have? The Martian, The Red Planet, what do they all have in common? They were all filmed right there in Wadi Ram, Jordan. Mortal Kombat 2, but we don't talk about the last one. <laughs> <laughs> the rest were re really good. And uh, so 
these are just space camps. These are wearing, they've evolved from 2016 to wearing Halloween costumes to now at the point where this year it's actually going to be a pressurized suit that's publishable science for humanity to take us to the red planet. And that's how it evolves. And, and when you're a 16 year old kid wearing a, a Halloween suit, you put that as your profile picture. And I'm like, I'm a kid playing astronaut. All of a sudden now, I'm an adult doing publishable science, wearing <laughs> spacecraft with my uh, at all. I'm not an at all anymore. I am one of those people in front of the at all. Uh, it, it, the name, is that a joke that lands or? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it's good to talk to academics. They get my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> That, that will actually uh, <laughs> benefit humanity and help us get to, uh, get to the red planet. And, and that, that's why I say inclusion is not just a matter of feeling better about ourselves for doing something well. We need everyone to get to Mars. We need everyone is help. We need the, the, uh, the best example I like to give, and you saw how much I love scuba diving. There is a scuba center in every coastal town around the world. There are millions of people scuba diving every single day, and they know the checklists of going through life support systems. And if we want to send millions of people to live and work in space, we're going to need a millions of those scuba centers that we call analog astronaut missions to train our astronauts to all live and work in space. And I'll just end with one last thing, and this is for Jason. There are two types of people in the world. People who pee in the shower <laughs> and liars. Thank you. Oh, Mac. Oh, Mac. Good one. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> if you do run over to your slide, I'm going to hand you the mic so that I, I we can hear you. Slide. Okay, fantastic. Everyone, please welcome I, PJ. Thank you. Thank you. How, how do you follow these acts? You know? uh, I, I made a, a little note here. So we, we got the analogs beyond the, the human gain. So we're looking at all the science, how you acquire and accumulate all this data. Uh, you have Jason here with this bubble of energy telling us about uh, these initiatives that are bringing analogs to areas that are remote, that uh, are fraught with possibilities. And as someone once put it to me, fraught with the ability to dream sometimes very important thing for humans to persevere, dreaming, the ability to dream, to visualize something in the future. And then of course, another bubble of energy here, first time we're meeting, but I, I, <laughs> I can see it. And you use the word inspiration. Well, yesterday when we had the privilege of sitting with, uh, with the White House and having this discussion about accessibility, about um, diversity in, uh, in analogs, but in STEM in general, thinking about space as a stepping stone into STEM, thinking about space as a stepping stone into bringing more young people from all backgrounds into what we are proposing here. Right? If we are proposing, as I heard yesterday on the first session, that by in the next 10 years we'll be in the moon, on the moon, and in the next 20 years we'll be on Mars, well, we will need to have a lot more diversity than what we have now. Because we are in this world right now, we see what's happening, and we know that this does not work. And the, the way you change that is by mainstreaming this diversity thinking. Not by adding it as an afterthought, but by mainstreaming it from, from the start, from the moment in which we are planning every single step. So I, I just wanted to tag along on the, the three elements that you guys had, because what I'm going to do is something different. Uh, I'm a recent analog astronaut, right? I just joined this community. Uh, but I want to tell you a story, because that's, that's what I do. I'm a storyteller. I've been a storyteller since I was uh, 15 years old. That's the first time that I joined a newspaper. Uh, I was in my newspaper in my prep school. Then I moved on to an award-winning newspaper on my secondary school. Then I moved on to my newspaper on my university. By the time I graduated, I got a job. Uh, I graduated in international politics uh, and development, uh, specializing in peace and security, uh, migration, and uh, human security. Those are kind of my things. So you might wonder, what, what is he doing here? Turns out that when I was 15, uh, I was one of the subjects. Uh, I was going to tell this as the story of there was a young boy. And then at the end, I was going to tell you, you might have guessed that that young boy was me, but it was just too contrived and I couldn't keep it straight in my head. So I'll just tell you it's, it's me. Uh, when I was 15, there was a program that was a STEM engagement program that involved also journalism. It involved language uh, learning skills. So 
you had an international crew. Uh, there were, at the time, there were four of us. Uh, and I'll also break the suspense here. I continue to be involved in this program until today. Uh, I, I am now a mentor and one of the board members of this uh, foundation, which is a UN observer on climate. This foundation sent me and a few other students who were like me, also 15, to the pretty much to the North Pole. Uh, we were 400 kilometers from the North Pole uh, in a research vessel owned by a very famous marine biologist who was at the time investigating the beginnings of our understanding of climate change. And we lived on that boat for six weeks. We lived with the scientists for six weeks uh, in an extreme, extreme environment. It makes his cold look like nothing. Ah. Uh, <laughs> and what happened after that is that I got in love with the Arctic. So I've now been to the Arctic 22 times. I've shot a couple of movies up there. Um, I got an elder of my own who's like my grandfather now who passes me on a lot of this knowledge, which, by the way, is interesting. Coming back to storytelling, something that I, uh, me and Paul discussed. Uh, my dad is West African, and something that our cultures uh, share is uh, kind of a, a reverence for the elders and for the stories that the elders passes. Uh, and so this was something that stayed with me from my very early age. And by the time I became a journalist, I became a journalist focusing on the stories of people, not on the things, even though I was writing about things. I was writing about uh, the political use of space. I was writing about human security. I was writing about things that were very high concept, but you need an entry point to that. And that entry point is human connection, i.e. people. Who are the people who are experiencing those things? You have to tell the story of other humans because as humans, we are social beings. We engage with the stories of our peers. That's how we have done it for thousands and thousands of years. Around the fire, around the table, that's how we have passed on knowledge. So I went on, on that mission and I continue to call it, I'm 43 years old now, I was 15 back then, I continue to call it my foundational moment because every single thing that I have done in my entire life to this moment goes back to that. And I'm very conscious of that, which is why I continue to mentor students through the same program to this day. Uh, so I went on to become a journalist. Then I went on to become um, a researcher. I was one of those guys that first started by et al. and then became like the guy before the et al. <laughs> Published dozens of uh, academic articles on my own specialty um, in the political field. Went on to be a political advisor. I traveled to 65, 67 countries and worked in all of those. Uh, and so I developed some sorts of expertise uh, and eventually had a midlife crisis by the time I was 40 and remembered that I had a dream back in the day. I was still, you know, a little bit too coward to go and, and do that because what do you do when you have a mortgage and you're 40? And uh, I was going to say you have a dog, so you <laughs> yeah. drive home the point, but I don't have a dog. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've always traveled too much to have a dog. It pains me, but there's other benefits. So what do you do when you want to change that, uh, that, that, that moment in your life? You know that there's something urging you, uh, but there's also something that is missing. And what I did was pivot to something else that I really liked. I like to storytell. Now, I, I will say that when I worked in politics, that's the same thing I was doing. I worked as an advisor to politicians. I was a communications advisor and political advisor on peace and security. And to me, explaining to a politician uh, what the migration crisis on the Mediterranean means, means telling stories, means transforming numbers of 200 people who just sunk on a boat into something that someone can engage with emotionally. Uh, so that, that is really the, 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 the task of a storyteller, right? So you can put the storyteller in any environment, but storytelling is storytelling. We all engage with it because we have been dealing with it since our moms told the stories when we were babies. So uh, I decided to pivot to film. You know, I came back from a mission in East Africa. I was a little bit tapped out uh, after this conflict. And uh, I found a program on documentary filmmaking, uh, which was super intense, a uh, four-month program that was Monday to Friday, nine hours a day. And then on Saturdays, you'd be out shooting. And by the end of it, you basically had a one-year program in the space of a very limited amount of time. And I thought I was going to be a filmmaker by the end of this. This is what they tell you at the beginning. Of course, then you finish. And remember, I said I had a mortgage. So... Of course, there's another contract and I need to pay my mortgage. And so I went back to what I thought was logical. I went back to my normal day job. So I flew back to East Africa. Uh, and I was at the time head of communications at the Peace and Security Department of the African Union. And it 
coincided with the 50th anniversary of our organization. And my boss, a super inspiring woman, uh, I don't say this many times, I work for someone who I would follow anywhere. Uh, I'm usually not a big person for heroes. I like to think for myself. This is one of the few times in my life that I thought I would trust anything that she tells me. And she decided she wanted to do a documentary about 50 years of peacemaking in Africa. Mind you, I laughed at first. Because, of course, if you know anything about Africa, is that there's wars everywhere. Um, my, my dad's home country and my, my, one of my citizenships uh, is Cape Verde. We are one of the very few peaceful, peaceful countries in Africa that have never had a war. And so the idea of peace in Africa by 2050 sounded preposterous. Uh, but she said something that you will recognize from hearing in, the, in these rooms, perhaps in the last couple of days. She said, it's not about reaching peace by 2050. It's about the aspiration. It's about the goal and working toward it like you actually mean it. So this stayed with me. Uh, so she wanted to do a film. And uh, she went around the communications table, asked for people to raise their hand if they wanted to lead it. And there were a lot of people that had worked with her for a long time. Uh, and no one raised their hand. So it turns out no one could make films. And I was fresh out of documentary school. I had done one student film. And I go like, well, I guess I will. Uh, and so here's how that happened. I made a film that was on Al Jazeera. It's not my film, it's their film. Uh, they had the budget. They gave me the number one production company in Ethiopia to basically do the entire thing. I just had to direct it. And so for the next two weeks in major events across Africa, I interviewed Nobel Peace Prizes and presidents and prime ministers about what their ideas of peace are. And then when my commission ended, I got back home to Toronto and I had a three month break, which is usually how it works a lot in these international fields. You kind of go away for three months and then you just need to not see people for three months and stay home. So COVID was actually okay for me. I like, I survived very well for the first year. Then the second year was a bit too much. Um, so I came back and I didn't know what to do really. Uh, I was inspired by that. And what I did was decide that I wanted to tell a story. And so I decided to make my first film of my own. Uh, it's funny that we went to the White House yesterday because, or that we met with the White House, it's COVID, oblige, we were not actually allowed in the White House. But uh, my first contact with Joe Biden was actually that my first film was nominated for uh, an award, uh, an initiative of Joe and Jill Biden for mental health treatments on screen. And, you know, it kind of pumped me. It was nothing. I was, I was just fresh out of film school. And all of a sudden, I realized maybe I have something to say. And so I started to do other films. I ended up working with ver various indigenous communities and various communities in, in Africa. So I'm very engaged in post, uh, in uh, co-productions across uh, the Atlantic, uh, very connected to, to my homeland as well. And all of this sounds great. This is to say, well, I, I should be satisfied with my life. It's, you know, it's, I've done some, I've done some cra crazy things, some, some amazing things. And the reality is that I wasn't because there was one dream that my mom reminded me of when I completed 40. Uh, I told her I was having a midlife crisis. So I was on the phone with my mom because that's what you do. And mm -hmm. she said, well, you've achieved so much. And as far as I can remember, there's only one thing. You are not a pilot yet. Because when I was a kid, I wanted to be a pilot. But I wear glasses, and back in the 1980s, 2020 was kind of the standard to be a pilot. Also, you kind of had an easier way if you went through the Air Force, and I just, not my kind of, uh, not, not my kind of vibe. Uh, and so I kind of gave up that idea until my mom said that. And the following day, I'm Googling. And as I'm Googling, I found a pilot school. I'm now engaged. I'm, I'm a pilot trainee. Uh, this is taking way longer than it should because, you know, before times and then COVID fog and then, so it's taking a little bit longer than I would like to. But because I was searching pilot and aerospace stuff on Google, Google is spying on you and starts to <laughs> offer me things related to other aerospace stuff. <laughs> and lo and behold, here's a mission on a Mars analog station. And they're asking, do you want to apply? And so I applied. Never in my wildest dreams did it occur to me that I would be accepted because of course, I grew up in a place where, um, as I was a kid, there were two types of astronauts, the American astronauts and the Soviet astronauts. Those are, were the astronauts. Even I heard today somewhere that even a few years ago, uh, Chris Atfield had never even dreamt of the possibility that a Canadian could be an astronaut. So let alone anyone. And here we are now in 2022 when there's astronauts from all over the place and we're about to see astronauts from many more places. Uh, I was just telling someone earlier uh, yesterday that 
uh, there's France has announced the the first female astronaut of uh, Maghreb origin, and so here's one for you know representation. We're starting to take that step. By the way, that line about the first person on Mars being a woman, you stole it. I I was planning to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that you were going. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I'll wrap by saying this: uh, that kid that was dreaming about being a pilot and then, you know, never even dreamt of being an astronaut. At the end of the day, we kind of all dreamt at some point of being an astronaut. It's like the coolest profession out there. It just never seemed to me in the realm of possibility. It seemed to me like being a pilot was quite something. Also, my family's from a, an island country, and so being a pilot is actually the equivalent to an American thinking he's going to be the president. A pilot is the coolest person on the country because you are literally the person who's able to go to all the islands all the time. So that to me was like the coolest thing. So I joined this uh, analog mission and I'm not going to repeat all the things that you said, you know, but I will say the thing about the dangers, right? Like I, I almost choked once during an EVA because of the effort and the fact that in Mars, oxygen replacement is a major thing. And so all of a sudden, I'm almost choking. And our radios, all of them, all six of them failed as I'm trying to tell my engineer, take the helmet off me. And I realized it's not working. And so I resorted to uh, sign language. And so I've been discussing with Jason how one of the things that we might be considering training uh, the crews to do is actually to have basic ASL training. So we're kind of looking at... Uh, various things. Diversity is a key element. Uh, because of the background that I come from, I've started to mainstream into this storytelling, a key element that I think you all recognize as fundamental sustainability, environmental sustainability. We have reached a point in which this silly conflict between do we go to Mars or do we save Earth is becoming a hindrance. And we need to take charge of the narrative and explain why that is foolish, why that is so easy to dismantle, and why there are many, many things that we can basically take from the research towards space and Mars that can be reapp reapplied to Earth and to what we need to do here. The final thing that I was going to say, and this is what I've been, I've been exemplifying it, uh, and I thank you for bearing with me, it's that the, the final element of this is storytelling. Because uh, we've heard, again, about all the cool things that you can do in many analogs and all the cool things that you can do when you reach out to communities that have different knowledge than yours. And we've heard about the inspiration, the excitement that all these kids on the camps have. This is storytelling. This is the thing that I was talking about at the beginning that we've been do doing by the table side, by the fireside, for thousands of years. That kid that couldn't imagine being an astronaut... Th that storytelling, you can't imagine if someone told you about it, if someone showed you that, yes, an astronaut is an, Chris Hatfield is a normal guy that grew up in rural Ontario or rural somewhere. I don't need <laughs> is he from Ontario? Yeah, rural Ontario. Let's go with Ontario. <laughs> like he grew up in a small place and probably never imagined being, well, he said so, he never imagined being an astronaut. And so it is about uh, that inspiration. But I, uh, I will finish with what I said, uh, Special Advisor Ho yesterday that it is actually about how you transform that inspiration into aspiration, so the ability to dream, to visualize, and how you then operationalize that into infrastructure, into creating the circumstances and the tools for that aspiration to be turned into something useful, whether that is becoming an astronaut, but let's face it, there will be not many of them to start with, or anyone involved in STEM and space, because to paraphrase uh, Jason yesterday, Space is a big place. There is space for everyone. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, PJ. Okay. Yeah. Occurred to me um, from some of the questions I got really quickly why I'm here in some of the panel discussions. And um, I would love to tell you that story another time. Two analogs, Poland and high seas, and they were incredible. And I would love to come to Canada because I'm a Chicagoan. So I know a little bit about snow and ice, but not, I I'm, was told that there's bikinis w that kids go in their swimsuits in the snow. I'm not, I don't know if I'm ready for that, but I'd like to see, I mean, challenge accepted. Your representatives <laughs> threw down the challenge and I'm, I'm thinking, okay. All right. Now, in Chicago, we call it the polar bear plunge. You call it Tuesday. So. 
<laughs> Artemis is back, so we can start now officially. All right. Um, so glad you're all here. We are back at the second half of our panel discussion on analogs. And we have with us some of the top analog participants. And may I point out, um, we've all taken our break and we're returning, but there were a lot of analogs um, in the audience. I counted two or three that had done analogs prior that I recognized. So we're everywhere. We're everywhere at this conference. So uh, there are some questions that Explore Mars has um, positioned and asked me specifically to invite all of us to discuss. And it, it truly is a discussion and, and please join in. Just because I have the microphone, we're all part of this. So um, I just wanna make sure everyone on the recording can hear us. So just jump on up, I'll give you the mic with your questions or we'll hand you one. <clears throat> Where are the gaps is the first question. Where are the gaps, number one? I told you we could all answer these, nothing surprising. Number two, how can institutions and organizations like Explore Mars assist us in those gaps? Great question, I mean, that's why we're here. And number three, we serve as ambassadors and we know that that comes with a very heavy responsibility to not only share our passion for the analogs, which Mac and Jason and Shauna and PJ, you do so well so well always impressive i'm so glad i finally got to finally get to meet you and uh, look forward to serving with you i hope on analog soon but when it comes to the students they want and when i say students all of us not just of student age traditional students all students of earth they want their analogs to be the stepping stones to the next thing here it is mars in this conference here today it can be other things. For some, it's music. For to, There's a STEM uh, lecture on entertainment going on down the hall, which I think where most people are right now. Well, the cool cats are in here. And uh, that's, that's a lot of stepping stones for them as well. They want this analog opportunity to showcase their talents and their connection to the storytelling, to the arts, to the, to the music, um, to the ways in which we are human. We're human. So please let's get started and just pontificate and enjoy with me the answers to some of these questions. Anyone who's ready can go grab the mic. Where are the gaps? How can Explore Mars fill those gaps in organizations like Explore Mars? And where are some of the real opportunities that analogs can provide for the students looking to use this to truly go to space and Mars and beyond and share their loves? who would like to try and jump right in. So um, to summarize the questions, where tasks are answering, answering are, where are the gaps? Um, how may Explore Mars support? And then how do we uplift others into this community? Um, so I'm gonna speak from the perspective, I know that's medical. Um, I'm a doctor and you know, when I say Mars is trying to kill you, it essentially is exactly that. It's, you know, where where is the limit on the space adaptation neuroocular syndrome? We don't know that. that, that beautiful brain juice that bathes our brain and spines, our cerebrospinal fluid. As far as we know, you know, there's no plateau to the increased pressure behind our eyeballs and the changes that happen in our brains with inc increased pressure. We don't know where the limit is. Um, radiation. We still have a question, a lot of questions to figure out about, you know, what is the extent of radiation damage? Um, the bottom line is the further out from earth you go, the more radiation you have to contend with, the higher the energy is. Um, and so, you know, there was once upon a time that we estimated that in between exposure to galactic cosmic rays, as well as um, solar particle events, that um, without adequate radiation shielding, one quarter, 25% of the crew would be blind from cataracts by the time they got to Mars. So that's, that's not great. Um, <laughs> You know, if you want to challenge, you know, don't just send an astronaut to Mars, send a blind astronaut to Mars. Um, and then the other question is, um, will we're, we're an ambitious species. We rise to the occasion. We see gaps and then we, we fill them. At some point, you know, there was a first hospital in Jamestown. There was a first baby born in Jamestown. Um, so we rise to the occasion. And so now we should ask ourselves, you know, we've identified these gaps and I've just named you two of them from a very long list. Um, you know, check out the human research roadmap from NASA's human research program. It goes on and on and on. Um, so then what technologies, what emerging technologies um, that are here and now today from immersive, virtual, augmented reality to artificial intelligence and machine learning um, to, uh, you know, the 
far off stuff like human hibernation. It sounds sci-fi, but the European Space Agency has run those numbers. They figured out that if you awaken your crew three weeks before landing on the red planet, you save on your volume costs as well as your supply utilization by 33%. Okay, so then then how do we close those gaps? And then let's get into the second question. How can Explore Mars support? You know, we're talking about big things. We're talking about huge ambitions. So then let's let's go all out. Let's establish a Mars prize, um, you know, and let's have a different theme, you know, every year or every X amount of years saying, well, um, this year we're funding, you know, a radiation challenge. This year we're funding a, a good model of the space adaptation neuroocular syndrome. Um, and then the other part of it is, you know, finally moving to the last part of this is let's just bring everyone with us on this journey. You know, not everyone needs to be a neuroscientist. Not everyone needs to be a space doctor. We can still tell them about their work. I hope it's becoming apparent that like I live, breathe, eat, sleep this stuff. This is what keeps me up at night. And I will tell you about it happily. I will corner you and talk to you about how Mars is trying to kill you in every respect. Um, but the thing is everyone else you know they, they get drawn into it you know so come on this ride and then you know that's that's how I ended up where I, where I am today my I, I try to pay it forward because people who didn't have to and when they were very established in their careers did the same thing for me and to just end it with a story um my first day at Johnson Space Center as an intern during an aerospace medical elective I was very frazzled I was a foreign national I was a Canadian I lost my passport I was not allowed on federal base. So I was very, very, um, you know, frazzled trying to figure out where my passport was. So I got into my off base office and the phone rang and I said, no, no, you have to hold on. I've lost my passport. And then I paused for a second and registered that the person on the other end of the line said, hello, my name is Lieutenant Colonel Chris Hadfield. Um, I understand you're a Canadian on base. Um, Would you like to come for coffee? And I just put him on hold. (laughs) And it's not like the man wasn't busy. He was training to become commander of the ISS in 2012. And so um, this just really hammers home the value of paying it forward because I wouldn't be where I am if someone, you know, of that stature hadn't said, I like space, you like space, let's talk about it. Um, There's so many stories out there. And so, you know, anytime I think, oh my gosh, I'm overloaded, I remember that story. And it's like, yeah, you know, we we go forward by lifting each other up and pulling each other forward. That's great. Um, I want to throw it over to Mac real quick. Mac just got back from the Analog Astronaut Conference, and I'm going to pitch you this question about the gaps. I'm going to kind of put it on you a little bit here, because Analog Astronauts, because we're so adventurous and we usually are the first, or we're trying to be, we don't collect our data well. It's not in a central database. I, this is a huge challenge and a huge focus. We are trying to do it because we're all off doing amazing things, having discoveries, improving humanity's experience in extreme environments, finding extreme environments, finding microbiomes in lava tubes and extremophiles, and it exists only in that person's laptop. Mac, what were some of the other, uh, I mean, that's one of the huge ones. I know you addressed it a little bit while you were there. What were some of the other ones that you can um, address from the conference that were gaps people were waiting to just solve? Well, the conference itself uh, should be uh, analog for all conferences that we ever go to uh, uh, in the future. It was, first of all, in the mother of all analogs at Biosphere 2, and that was just magical there by itself. Uh, I think, just, I mean, you have Pete Conrad size gaps and you have Michael Strahan size gaps. And thank you. Oh my goodness. No one ever laughs at that joke. You know, but uh, the first gap is, is a gap that was given to us by Bill Anders and Frank Borman and Jim Lovell Christmas Eve 1968 when they said, you sent the wrong people. You should have sent poets. You should have sent artists. And we still haven't done that. We're still living that gap. And I fail right now to, to, to tell you how magical that experience at Biosphere 2 was. But what I can tell you is no one is going to remember thrust to weight ratio talk of this or that you know, conversation. Everyone is going to remember Mary Liz Bender's performance. Uh. Everyone is going to remember Jesse's rapping that night and the, the magical words and everything. So that art and that storytelling that you, were, that you were talking about is what Anders 
Borman and and uh, and Lovell were talking about of, of of connecting that story, and that is a huge gap. This whole industry, I think, still suffers from. So, what can uh, Explore Mars, you know, learn from that? It's relearn what we was already given to or told to us fifty years ago. I want to remind everyone that tomorrow, our I think one of the best of the best is Dr. Cyan Proctor, who flew as a poet. Not as a pilot, although she broke those barriers, right? Dr. Cyan Proctor is a person who bridges that gap, and she'll be here tomorrow, so I cannot wait. Um, any other, um, and we'll get to questions one more second. I just want to give both of you an opportunity to answer that with regards to the gap, being an ambassador, or the ways that Explore Mars can help fill that gap. Do you guys have any comments? I have a quick one. So, um I think, uh, you know, f first of all, as a storyteller, I'm going to say that the gap, one of the primary ones is the storytelling. We're, this is a flaw of academia. It's a flaw of research in general. We talk a lot to each other. All of us laugh at, this, at the geeky jokes. All of us, you know, like the Big Bang Theory t-shirts that are kind of funny. <laughs> but we need to do better than that. We need to be communicating with people who are not science majors, who are not... You know, they could be the kids that we were talking about that maybe one day will conceive of the idea of being an engineer, of being a geologist, whatever it is. So that storytelling element means creating narratives, creating heroes. I don't want to say myths, but, you know, if uh, Dr. Pandya goes to space at some point, there's going to be a million kids out there kind of looking when at her. She and, uh, yeah. When she goes to space, exactly. <laughs> uh, I, I gave up that idea, but, you know, like for me, <laughs> you, never never. You, never, you never say never. Uh, but uh, the other element is also how we communicate. And this, I, I think, is crucial. Now, coming from a production standpoint, we are still, even here in this conference, we're still communicating in a way that is already passé, right? We're going on Facebook and Instagram, kids are no longer in either of those things. Right now, we need to be looking at transmedia platforms. We need to look at uh, platform agnostic plat uh, communication. So we need to be thinking at places that would not be logical for us to be thinking about right now, but that's where young kids are. They're on Minecraft. You know, you can visit the Library of Congress on Minecraft, even if you are in China and you want to read a banned book. Uh, you can go on Roblox. You can go, you know, Fortnite. I don't even start to understand how Fortnite works. <laughs> I know they make billions. I know the kids of my nephew's generation spend all their time in it. Th this is where they're acquiring information for better or worse. We can discuss ad nauseum whether this is good or bad, but the reality is they are sourcing information out of there. And so we need to be providing information out of there in the capacity and in the formats and in the sizes that they are consuming it. And the, this kind of brings us to the second thing that I think is a gap, and that's the human factors. Uh, we heard yesterday in some panel that we basically have all the technology that we need, or we will in very in the very short term have all the technology that we need to go to the moon, to go to space. The rockets are not the problem. The problem is understanding all the things that you study, the body, how our body works, and primarily how our mind works. We have all just gone through this pandemic and if NASA was not looking at mental health so tightly before the pandemic, all of a sudden, this is like the biggest sample that you could ask for. We all went a bit crazy, right? It's, it's, it's too much. And so we understand fully well that the main challenge is how do you take human beings across nine months of travel inside a matchbox, 12 of them on top of each other, and they don't kill each other. That is the main challenge. And so I think that comes to uh, the importance of analogs and exposing astronauts, future astronauts, to analog training that is ever more strict, ever more intense in analog sites more and more times so that by the time you, you reach that, you, it's not going to be foolproof, but you will be prepared. It's not going to be your first time facing this. Great answer, yep. PJ. I love, thank you for reminding me to live where we want to reach that audience. When I see my kids play Fortnite, I get the latest music. I get all my trends. I get update. I get trendy in two minutes when I'm watching them play Fortnite. And by the way, they get to be in this VR world where they get to be a character. Where's the astronaut characters? Right? Am I right? Hi. So I work at the Staten Island Zoo and I've been te teaching classes. So I have students. Because of Minecraft, all of my students, like every single one of them, know what an axolotl is. And most adults do not know what an axolotl is. So that just tells you that that's where they're hanging out. Thank yeah. you. That's true. Jason, any thoughts before we open it up to the questions, which I want to make sure we get to? 
So, so on my perspective, I completely agree with what you're all saying. Um, I think a big gap is uh, education and um, inspiration. Uh, getting back to my initial presentation and echoing, uh, going to uh, rural communities and finding a way that everyone can be part of this because you never know where the next space champion might be. Uh, it might be, uh, for all we know, in Baffin Island or it could be uh, in the desert uh, of Africa. Uh, so it is increasingly more important than ever that we are inclusive and uh, we diversify space and make it inclusive for everyone and that we outreach beyond borders because humanity is going to only succeed in space if we work together and not if we um, unfortunately do bad things to each other uh, like PJ said uh, it could be a matchbox um, <laughs> So, so, so it is uh, very important to, to outreach and do these agreements between all the nations, uh, the academic world, the, uh, uh, the industry. Um, by no means, I am a scientist. I am just a crazy person uh, that really wants to inspire the youth and showcase all the wonderful world, all, uh, all the wonderful people, what everyone here is doing and to inspire them so that they can make a difference and that they can go to Mars knowing that there was people supporting them and that they weren't told you can't do this uh, it is not if it is I will and that's what we need to show people and we are all stardust at the end of the day oh, thank you, Jason I know before we get you to you Artemis Katie has been dying to ask the panel questions because she's studying this as a student I want to give you that opportunity Katie please come get the mic and just come right up and then Artemis we're coming back to you She's a student. I'm not sure where she can tell us where, but she said you, we are up here repeating her master's thesis. So please. I guess I looked really excited in my seat over there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I'm actually a student at University of Florida, or was. I just graduated in December with my master's in microbiology. Thank you very much. And um, my, uh, my thesis was uh, microbial adaptations to space flight and uh, human implications. So basically your presentation was word for word like I was telling my husband, I mean, it was basically the outline of my thesis. So it was really exciting to hear. Um, so I have actually two questions in one statement. I'll make it quick, I promise. Um, are any of you guys um, doing any um, experiments with like bioreactors, things like that, like on the microbial level or just purely like human analogs? I might be incorrect. Um, did you high seas? Uh, I did not do high seas. I'm Project Possum. But in our analog, if you saw the girl holding the microgreens, so one of the things we're studying is the um, decomposition and the production of methane in the, in, the, in the process, having to harvest that and using that as thrust. So... Uh, all sorts of bacteria, and so we all got a little gift of a mini, mini micro reactor to create spirulina. And the goal was uh, because we were all very curious about our research, and so she created these little test tubes that kind of generated light and explained to us this is what spirulina needs to be happy. You know, heat, warmth, uh, uh, being quiet, all the things. You've, probably a bunch of of you here know this better than me. And we started to treat them as pets. Uh, we gave them names, uh, and by the end of the mission, some of them had died. Some of them were thriving. Our commander proudly you. called hers the Borg, <laughs> and the Borg survived. <laughs> um, Katie, at high seas, there are two that I can point out that I recall. Please tell me if I'm wrong, doctor. Um, the first one was we swabbed our cheeks and collected our DNA samples, which have been now sent officially. Well, the stepping stone is that they are on the current crew um, right now in space, um, collected all the DNA samples, not just from us on our analog, but from others who can buy a kit called LifeShip. Um, LifeShip, you've heard of it, I'm sure. If not, I'll tell you at the break. And the second thing is um, because we had the incredible JJ Hastings with us as our commander, we needed to bacterial swab every day, twice a day, 20 areas, that's all I'm going to say about that until, <laughs> until you guys probably did it too, until we, um, and I thought it was just kind of one of those things that stay, what happens in the analog stays at the analog until <laughs> I ran into the incredible Chris Sembrowski from Inspiration4 in Chicago where I live. I got the pleasure of speaking with him for quite some time and we were comparing swab notes 
the things that we do as analog astronauts, but our microbiome as we know changes in space, but it also changes as we gather over long periods of time on these analogs. And then if I could maybe off camp, I'm gonna go there, I don't care. I was on an all female mission. We all had the same cycle. Yeah, and that's two right. of us were on medication for cycles. How do you explain that? So there, that's a biology. I mean, these are the things, right? As humans, we have to study and look at. Your second question, please. Okay, um, so like you said, you were saying um, there's a lot of different characteristics that come with spaceflight, like microgravity, desiccation, isolation, things like that. Um, which one do you guys find is the most difficult to find or create for an analog for that? I would say radiation um, is understudied, especially when we talk about comparing apples to oranges because um, the type of radiation we see on Earth is kind of the nice premium radiation, whereas once you're out in deep space, you have to deal with the big scary ionizing energy from GCRs, galactic cosmic rays, and solar particle events. Um, so I don't. I think we need a better model for that. Um, and then... The, the space adaptation neuroocular syndrome, like we, we right now that is a showstopper for Mars, unless we figure out what level of gravity um, we need or what type of countermeasures, because we don't know if that plateau so far. Um, the crew dynamics, you know, that that's well studied and well optimized um, and rightly so. Um, and then I would like to see more, actually now that you've got me started, two last ones, uh, more research around optimizing and mitigating lunar and Martian dust. Um, as a respiratory and skin irritant, as well as for clogging up suit joints, and then um, medevac capabilities. Because I was looking at the Mar NASA Mars concept of operations for medical operations, and this is put out in 2019, so it may be updated now, but they were saying, okay, well, if you run into an emergency at launch, we'll evacuate. If you run into an emergency in trans-Earth um, or peri-Earth orbit, you know, we'll evacuate you. But once you get to trans-Mars injection, landing on Mars, on Mars, you're on your own, so don't send your favorite astronauts. Um, so why, why don't we just you know, do what humans do best and say, what if? What if we had a good medical evacuation capability? What if we had state-of-the-art life support on Mars? Um, what if we you know, re-engineered? What if we had a Vasmir plasma, plasma rocket that could you know, bring us to Mars and back in 39 days? So this is where the big thinking comes in. So there's no, no one answer. You ask you know, 100 space life sciences and space med folks, um, I would say that will, those will come up frequently. And then of course, food and crew dynamics. Thank you. Oh, uh, my statement was actually to PJ. Um, it was very inspiring to hear you. Um, you know, you started out in one field and then kind of completely went in an opposite direction because I know that happens for a lot of us. Um, like I know myself and my husband were both professional pilots. And so I kind of am the opposite of you. I started out in aviation. He's on the Airbus. I'm on the 7-6. Um, and now I'm getting back into like science. So it's like very inspiring to hear because, you know, you always hear like, I knew what I wanted to do since I was 15. And I'm like, I didn't do that. So, <laughs> but anyways, thank you. And if you ever have any flying questions, feel free to ask. We were also flight instructors. So we'll share information. Someone told me once when I said I wanted to be a pilot and this person knew me and the other things that I did. And they said, well, yeah, that sounds like a pilot because every pilot I know does about seven other things. So thank you very much. Um, okay, Artemis, would you like to uh, wrap up with our last question? It is 345, but like I said, we're all available. We're all here. So feel yeah. free to approach us after this. But let's do this as our last question since you kicked it off. Okay. Well, there are two gaps that I always see. The one is we are inspiring kids and, you know, I'm in that sense, probably also their parents, grandparents, neighbors, aunts, uncles, you know. So it's always a snowball effect. That's nice, but we need money, right? And we need political will. So whom the gap we're always forgetting, and I, I, I have an example of that. There's a quite well-known science journalist in the Netherlands who, for some strange reason, because he once was on a panel and he was supposed to be against human spaceflight, he got so into that role that 20 years later, he was still fighting human spaceflight. And... So we get him to MDRS in 2002. We get him in a suit. We get him on an ATV. And now he's driving with a crew. He's no longer anti-human spaceflight, you know? That, I think that happened like in the first five minutes in his suit. So, you know, so that's, you know, and we have to do the same thing with politicians. 
we have to make them experience what it means to be more than you know just the role that they right have now hey the journalists make them experience space and it exact or you know you know or at at Cochrane we'll we'll find a way Neptune you know we'll find a way um so that's one the other gap that we always 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 do not want to talk about at least not in the USA in the Netherlands in Sweden in Denmark we might be a bit more easy humans need touch if there's something we have learned over the last two years of lockdowns is the fact that I couldn't do this you know because people go like now I'm infected I'm not going to infect you I know <laughs> I mean I was just tested I know and, and also you know fully vaccinated <laughs> careful but anyway so you know and so many people young and old at least in the Netherlands but I do believe that it's all over the planet were reporting the fact that they felt depressed and part of the depression was the fact that you do not gather your grandpa in a hug which normally you would do you know you might visit the person but you stay away you know and and this so what the big gap is we're going to space we're going to send a group of people so we're going to send men you know, well they won't be homosexuals among them right we're going to, we're going to send a mixed crew oh god there might be sex well if they're adults and it's consenting sex between consenting adults as a dutch person i don't mind because you know what you do what i do you're a, you're an adult if you're not hurting anyone that's fine the idea that it won't happen the idea that we're not talking about it the idea that you're building an analog without you know walls that can be taken down between two beds you know we'll really and i'm serious we'll need to talk about it because the european habitat had and the architect that i referred you to had ideas about how to make it collapsible so that if relations existed it would simply be a truth of life like i said adults and i know that nasa especially but perhaps others perhaps the european space agency also is like ah oh, we can't talk about that and you know there's never been sex on the iss that's a really sad story i think yeah. you know <laughs> if that's true and so like i said it's not that i want to be in the room with those people because i want my privacy when i have sex so i do believe they have a right to have that privacy and again i don't care whether it's male female uh, you know male male female female i don't care it's adults they have their own orientation if they're not hurting anyone not 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 you know pressuring anyone into things they don't want fine but not talking about it not saying if we go into space if we go to the next you know to the moon and to mars but even to the moon and we are trying to you know to 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 do as if these people are not people not adults in the full sense of all that that entails then we're not really sending humans are we we're sending robotized i i don't know life forms and that's not what we want to do because like i am always saying we need to send everyone every community if we go we 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 are there we humans with our likes and dislikes our hates our loves and yeah with our sex drive unless there's something that i don't know about the medical things that happen in space i, I thought you were going to say we when we crave touch and things i thought you were going to say we need puppies in space <laughs> I was like, yes, hey, I am puppies to Mars. The I, next no, no, no. I'm Dutch. <laughs> we have sex education in the sense that we we answer questions in classrooms of four or six years old. And no, we're not going to be in the technicality of the sexual acts. But if a kid asks, you know, where babies come from, we're not going to, you know, go the stork story. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, I know, if I say yes. which is bad for kids. We have hardly any teen pregnancies because it's not just you know about boundaries and about sex education. Is you know giving young people agency about their feelings. Thank you, Artemis, and oh, I want to thank this panel. I want to thank you for watching. So, um, Jason, thank you, Mac, thank you so much, Shauna, PJ. Thank you. Find them in the hallways. Let's continue the conversation and we'll see you at the next panel. Thanks.